Good afternoon, everyone. This is the YouTube channel, Speaking the Truth in Love. I'm Sister April Vassell. And the Lord has been really moving. He's been encouraging me in order to keep moving forward with his assignment for my life through this channel. And he gave me a really special word. Excuse me, folks. Apparently, there's a fire alarm going off. The family is cooking too much downstairs, so every once in a while it goes off. Still got to keep it moving, right? Um, he gave me a very special word on how to basically move forward as, not just for myself, but this word will apply to many of you out there to be able to grow and flourish according to the plan that he has, not only for my life, but for your lives as well. So stick around. You'll really appreciate this. First things first, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for another day, another opportunity in order to move forward with this channel. Give me every word that you want me to speak according to the way that you want me to speak it. Not add things that you don't want or subtract things that you do want. Help me to hear you, see you, understand, and convey every single thing according to your heart's desires. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is going to sound a little crazy. But, how many of you know God can use anything to convey a message? In this instance, he gave me some song lyrics, very popular, well-known song lyrics from the late singer Bob Marley. Now, what does Bob Marley have to do with this? If you're familiar with his song, I Shot the Sheriff, no, I'm not telling you to kill anybody out there, so don't even go there. Um, there's a lyric in that song where he explains animosity that he had with an individual that kept going after his life. And the Spirit kept bringing this particular lyric back up into my mind and in my heart, and he wouldn't let it go. He just kept nagging me about it. So the lyric goes... Um, Sheriff John Brown always hated me for what I don't know and this is the key lyric that I'm going to focus in on every time I plant a seed he'd say kill it before it grow he'd say kill them before they grow and the spirit kept bringing that lyric back over and over and over and over and over again it's like why do you keep nagging me about this and then all of a sudden, I had a question. Wait a minute. How do you kill a seed before it grows? And as soon as that question came into my mind, the spirit just started working, 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 working. He had me go online and look at things in order to kill seeds. You know, so he said, look at weeds. So I looked at weeds. And he brought me to a website. They'd explain how to prepare soil in order to be able to plant whatever it is that you want. Now, in most instances, people use herbicides and things like that to spray all over the ground, kill off what's there, and then you go ahead and plant what you want. Mm -mm. That's the quick and cheap and lazy way of doing things. The Spirit had me look at this concept called let me look at my notes here. Soil solarization. And when he had me look at that, it's a much more in-depth, hard work applying process in order to prepare land in order to make it fit for the seed that you want to plant. So the topic that he gave me for today is weed killer or seed killer. 
at the end, there are three scripture references that he's, he's kind of given me in order to build the case that he made. And that would be uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The second one will be Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. And the last one will be Joel chapter 2, verse 25. But first, we're just going to jump right on into this. So I'm going from my notes. As I said before, he kept bringing up the lyric, Every time I plant a seed, he say, kill it before it grow. So for a soil soilization, it's an organic way, I'm going by my notes here, to kill weeds before they grow. It's time consuming, but it completely removes the problem of weed seeds out of the soil, totally eradicates it. First, the land must be completely cleared of vegetation, meaning trees, roots, or anything that's obvious that can be pulled up. So they need to be dug up, pulled up, yanked up, ripped out, cut down off the top. Dig up all roots, stumps, kill the tap root if it happens to be a tree. You can't just kill the roots, regular roots that are running around it because they'll just grow back in a different place. You have to kill the tap root, the main root that basically the tree draws sustenance and water from. Once you kill that, you've basically killed the tree. It's like severing an, um, an artery. Once you sever um, an artery, you don't stitch it back up within minutes. A person is dead. Same thing with a taproot for the tree. Once you cut it, it's, it's, it's done. It, it will take, it'll just like, it's, it's done. Um, the next thing that needs to be done in order to prepare land for um, for growth, to get rid of weeds and things like that, kill things off before they grow, is to grab a, a tool called a tiller. It's basically a glorified fork. Um, in some cases, it's like a lawnmower, but it's with longer spikes that go down deeper into the ground in order to pull things up that you can't pull on your own or make them a little bit easier to reach. And Sometimes tillers can be like a, like a spikes on a long stick with a handle at the top and you twist it and twist it and twist it to get deeper down into the soil in order to reach those roots that may not come up with just a simple long mower or a simple pulling or tugging and things like that. It requires much more effort. Since it's deeper in the soil, you need something in order to get deeper down into the soil to unearth it so you can get at it and get rid of it. Um, let's see, deeper into the ground. Pull up deeply embedded roots of weeds so that they don't re sprout and reseed and, and contaminate the land that you're working on. Next, you get a rake. Yes, a rake. Everybody knows what a rake is. It's basically a glorified comb turned upside down with a stick attached to it. And most farmers, gardeners, things like that, they use that to scrape and pull up whatever it is that they've already cut and yank it out and clear a, cl um, a path so they know what they've worked on so far and what they haven't. It smooths out the land and it pulls up whatever residue that had been worked on. So you get a better idea of how the land is being prepared, whether your efforts are already done or if you need to put in a lot more work. So when you rake the land, you're pulling up rocks, twigs, and whatever else has been unearthed in order to get an idea of basically what you're staring at. Now, you would think after doing all of that, the land would be ready in order to plant seeds. 
Not at all. There's still more work that needs to be done. After you've done all of that, and you, you cut down the trees, you pulled up the roots, you, you use the tiller to dig down deeper and pull some more things up, and then you raked everything in order to pull up some rocks and everything. You're still not done. After doing all of that, the next step is to wet the soil. Now, why on earth would you need to wet the soil? It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? You're not going to put anything down in it yet, so why wet it? Ah, there's logic to this. Apparently, during for soil soilization, when you wet the soil, you know, during a warm time of year, you're giving the land an opportunity to show you whether or not there are still more weed seeds down in there. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're still not there. There are some weed seeds, depending on how many times that land has been tilled over and tilled over and tilled over. They're deeper down underneath the ground where you can't see them. The land looks clean, but it's not. So by pouring water or wetting the soil, I mean spraying it really good, it gives the seeds that may still be down there that you didn't see a chance to re-sprout. Ah, now it makes sense. So during the warm months, spray that land and let the, the seeds get warm and moist and they start to germinate and grow back up again. Ah, so now all of a sudden you start to see that there were still some other weed seeds down in there that you didn't get the first time. Give them the opportunity in order to reveal themselves in the sunlight after a few days. You know, that good sun gets down in there, they have all that moisture down in there, and they start to sprout back up. Aha! So I, that tells me I need to go back over the land again. So, once the remaining weeds sprout to the surface, they are dug up and removed. Now, you would think after all of that, the land is clean, it's clear, it's fine, you can go ahead and use it again. No, there's still another step in all of this. After the second batch of weed seeds or weed sprouts have been dug up, yanked up, pulled up by their roots, then a plastic cover is put over the top of the field. Hmm. Now why would you cover the, the field with a plastic tarp? I know for all of you hobbyists out there that do gardening or for you official um, farmers out there, this is your livelihood and everything. I'm sure your, your ears are perking up at some of this. Um, so this really and truly to you, this makes sense. They'll put a plastic tarp over the top of the field that's just been cleared. They'll secure it with stones to make sure that the tarp doesn't move. This is usually done during the hottest months of the year, somewhere between June and July, and it's left out there for two months. So why would you go ahead after wetting the ground, ripping up the, the secondary weed seedlings or whatever they are, sprouts, you put a tarp on it, why would you leave it out there for two months? To warm up and heat up the soil. Now, the theory behind this is, after you pulled all that stuff up, there still may be other seeds down in there that you couldn't reach. So by putting the tarp over the land in the hottest months of the year, you're basically steaming, then you're basically boiling, then steaming, then baking whatever remaining seeds and sprouts are down there in that ground to the point where the seedlings or the little sprouts that may have remained, the heat and the water combined basically kills it completely. And then after it's, it's killed off, the heat from the land being covered by the tarp 
and the sun beating down on it in order to make that land super, super hot, somewhere between 180 and 200 degrees, possibly even a little bit more than that. Um, it completely sterilizes the land. It completely dries it out, bakes up every single thing, every germ, every parasite that's down in there to make sure it's completely dead. And after that process is complete, after that two month period is complete, then you can take the tarp off of it. It will have killed off all the other remaining parasites and the land is then completely fit to be used. So what does that have to do with every time I plant a seed and say kill it before it grow? It depends on whether it's a weed or a seed. Whenever God wants to work on our lives, he first has to cultivate the land, which is us. We are a threefold being. We're spirit, soul, and body. But when God looks at us, he looks at us as seed, soil, and harvest. So in order to clear our lives to make us fit for his use, then he has to be like a farmer. He has to dig down into our lives and clear away the hindrances and encumbrances that are in our lives. This is where the generational curse part comes in. Sometimes he's got to pull up some bad seeds or some bad trees bad habits would be the best way to look at it that have been left and passed down from generation to generation to generation that are still sitting in our lives, whether it be ways of thinking, ways of behaving, uh, the way we, we treat others, the way we treat our physical bodies, just whatever the hindrances may happen to be, some of them are very, very deep and they've already sprouted and they've grown up to be these full-blown trees in the middle of our lives. So he's got to hack down some of those, tr you know, those bad trees in our lives. And it takes a lot of work. If alcoholism was a huge thing in a family, he's got to hack down that tree of alcoholism. And then he's got to uproot the taste for it. And then he's got to clear away any of the bottles or the liqueurs or the other items that have alcohol in them that one might develop a taste for or still have a yearning for out of a person's life. And then after that, he's got to dig down deeper to make sure he didn't miss any things that you might try and fill in the space of what you had before and then after he clears all of that, he has to dry you out. Ah, makes sense, doesn't it? After he dries a person out, then he gives them an opportunity in order to be prepared for his use. That's just an example there. So that's basically what sin is like. Center, it happens to be these weeds or full-blown roots or trees that are buried in a human life. And he's got to go in there and unearth all of that stuff and pull it up, dig it out, weed it out, cut it down, and go over it, not just once. Sometimes he's got to do a threshing process, go through it again and again until he's sure that he's gotten every single bit of it out of a human life in order to make sure it's fit for his personal use. So, um, getting back to the song lyric here, I kept thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And so, 
Sheriff John Brown always hated me for what I don't know. Every time I plant a seed, he said, kill it before it grows. So the next question came up, how did the sheriff know what he was planting? The answer, he was being watched all the time. Now, that means 24-7 surveillance. Interesting, right? The Lord was showing me as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. Our enemy, the devil, usually has somebody or something somewhere to keep us under surveillance 24-7. Be it a demon, an imp, a family member that's yielded themselves um, through spirits of anger, jealousy, hatred, whatever it is, to making us their personal pet project. So if you get the feeling that you're being watched some of the time, you are. It's not your imagination. The greater your threat, I'm going back to my notes here, the greater your threat to the devil's kingdom, the greater the level of surveillance and the number of agents that he places around you to stop whatever is whatever it is that God had planned for you to do in in your life in order to build up his kingdom and tear down Satan's kingdom. When you when I look at the part of the lyric that says kill it before it grows, it has a double application there. God is a weed killer. Satan is a seed killer. So when you hear the lyrics, kill it before it grows, that's usually Satan's modus operandi. He's known as the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys. So a lot of the time when you hear kill it before it grows, he's talking about us. Not just the assignments that God has for us, but literally trying to kill, kill us, kill him, kill her, kill you, whoever, before you grow. In a lot of cases, I know in my own personal life, this may have happened in some of your lives as well. God had planned something for you. He had ordained something for you. He had some, uh, something all mapped out for you. And before it even got off the ground, something happened in order to stop it dead in its tracks. That is killing something before it grows. Cut off its potential. Before it even gets up off the ground, just stop it. Do whatever you got to do in order to just shut it down. Before it even gets a chance to flourish, to blossom, to even sprout. That's how much surveillance some of you have from the enemy. It's not your imagination. Some of you, you've done all the preparation work that God told you to do. You've cleared the land. You've pulled up the weeds. You got rid of the rocks. You got rid of the roots. You got rid of the habits. You got rid of the associations. You got rid of the bad connections, you changed your locations, you changed jobs, you've, you've, you've basically gotten rid of the hindrances that were in your life and you're really up and running and ready to go. And just as you're starting to get the new work that God has given you and, and get it off the ground, all of a sudden something, somebody, somewhere tries to shut it down. That's the enemy working against you. Before you can get your new um, web page off the ground, before you can get your new Instagram blog off the ground, before you can get your new YouTube page off the ground, all of a sudden, Satan will send somebody somewhere with a, either a big mouth or, or an agenda or false promises, false hopes, something in order to derail your progress before it even gets off the ground. And God is trying to warn you about that. Be careful of your friends. Be careful of your associations. Be careful of those around you that try and kill the seed that God has placed in your heart. 
whether it be for the gospel or whether it be for missions or whether it be for um, building a godly family or a godly career or um, just whatever it is that God laid upon your heart in order to do. Beware of seed killers, people who try and kill the seed before it grows. Okay. Um, trying to stick to my, my notes here. Uh, when God pulls something out of your life, he's trying to kill off the hindrances in your life while Satan is trying to kill off the potential in your life. Anything that God would want to use for his kingdom and he's trying to cultivate in your life, Satan will try every trick in the book in order to shut it down. And here's the thing. He, anything he does against God and God's children, it's tailor-made with two factors, insult on top of injury. So he doesn't mind you doing all the work, the clearing the path and digging up the weeds, the hoeing, the shoveling and all the rest of that in order to get the land prepared. He'll sit there and go, hmm, 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 and watch you do all that work. Wipe the sweat off your face, throw stuff in the bag, get everything perfectly cleared away. And just as you're about ready in order to put down some good seed, he'll throw weed seeds in there while you sleep. And make you have to start all over again. So the injury is having to start all over again. The insult is he's the one who threw all those seeds in there after watching you do all that hard work. And God is trying to warn us that the devil has sown people just like this in our lives. That don't mind watching you clear away all the habits in your life. Don't mind watching you change all your friends and your associations. Don't mind watching you change your eating habits and all these things that God told you to do in order to prepare your life for his use. He'll watch you do all of that. And just at the very point when you got all the prep work done, that's when he attacks. To try and spoil it, throw obstacles, injury, damage into your life. To throw you back off track or completely knock you out. And make you have to start all over again if he hadn't taken you out completely. The whole goal is to kill the seed of the gospel inside of us so that it has no use. It doesn't germinate. It doesn't grow. It has no effect whatsoever so that God can't use us at all. That is the purpose of the exercise. Still going by my notes here. So when God's clearing and pulling all these things out of our lives, it's not an accident. Sometimes you go through upheaval seasons. That's him pulling the things out of your life. Sometimes you'll go through a quiet time where it looks like everything is okay. And then he'll go back into our lives and there'll be more upheaval. For a while, he's digging deep down into the soil of our lives and our hearts in order to unearth those things that maybe we didn't even know about or family issues that had been buried deep in our lives that we had no idea were the sources of our problems. But he could see it. And so he unearths them. And during those seasons when he's unearthing things and he's going deep, I mean really deep, deep, deep down into our lives and we're going through deep trials and tribulations and turmoil and things like that. How many of you know there's a lot of weeping that goes with it? Yeah. A lot of weeping, a lot of crying, sometimes some deep wailing. And those tears are watering the soil of our hearts. 
in our souls. Now, here's the thing. God knows what he's doing. He's not trying to necessarily, you know, really hurt us, even though we do get hurt from time to time, let's be honest. But um, what he's doing is, while you're weeping and you're crying and he's preparing the heart, your, the soil of your heart, what he's also doing is while you're going through this difficulty and upheaval at the time, he's allowing your enemies to watch you go through all of this. And here's the thing. As the tears come down, the enemies pop up. Yeah. People that were enemies that you didn't even know were enemies, all of a sudden they have huge smiles on their faces when they see you suffer, when they see you go through adversity, when they see you go through trials, enemies that you didn't know you even had. So those tears that are watering your soil are also exposing the enemies that are in your life. This is the way the Spirit was showing me. As these tears are coming down your face, God's not trying to be cruel. He's trying to unearth some enemies in your life. Some of them that may be family, friends, employers, people you associate with that you didn't even know had something against you or they begrudged your progress or they were envious of you or whatever reason that they may have had that you were not aware of. Your tears have brought the joy up out of them. The sorrow in your heart has caused the joy in them to start to grow. So your tears, the watering of your soil, has exposed the weeds of enemies that you didn't even know you had. Sometimes God has to do that. Sometimes he has to allow you to go through some rough seasons and some rough trials to expose some folk because some enemies are deeper than you thought. Some of them, they've, they've hung out during the regular warm climate seasons and everything, but those deep, stormy, hurricane, tornado-type se seasons and everything where stuff gets ripped up has unearthed them. Sometimes God allows things to happen to unearth and show you the people who are around you that don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. Wisdom here. Deep wisdom that sometimes we don't even understand. So once he unearths and exposes and gives them the opportunity to show themselves, to let their real motives reach up to the surface and sprout so you can see them and everything, then he cuts them off. He removes them. Because depending on how large the assignment that God has for you, will determine the amount of weeds he rips up and removes. Weeds meaning people in this instance. Sometimes he's got to remove some people from your life and they were deeply rooted down in there so deep that it would have to take a crisis in order to expose just how much of a treacherous enemy they really are to you. So you'll accept the fact that they need to go and you won't argue with him when he removes them. When God gets ready to do a work in your life, he removes the old people, places, things, and the old nature of your life and prepares it for something new. So, in order to get to the scripture context of it. I know this seems a little bit drawn out, but God has a purpose behind everything that he does and that he says. For the first scripture that he gave, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, in order to be ready for his use, you have to be willing for him in order to clear away all the, the weeds that are in your life. So when he does get ready to use you, everything will flourish and grow the way it's supposed to. It won't get cut off before it even has a chance. 
to live. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a very familiar scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, that's the cultivation part, humble yourself and admit that Either you've done something wrong or things are wrong and you can't fix this thing the way that it is. You need help. Humble yourself and pray and seek my face, meaning turn to him, not to some strange gods or sticks or rocks or twigs or shoots or shrubs. Turn to the God of heaven, his son Christ, and his Holy Spirit of wisdom in order to show you exactly what the problem is. Seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, meaning don't keep throwing weeds, seeds into your own garden, into your own life. Don't keep repeating the same patterns that you did before. Do things differently. Then will I hear from heaven, I, the Most High God, maker, ruler of the entire universe, this is what he's saying, I will hear you from heaven. I will forgive your sin, means I'll clear away your past, and we'll start fresh. And here's the key thing, I will heal their land, means whatever it is in your life that needs healing, cultivation, restoration, a new wind of life, he will do that for you. The second scripture that he gave me, was Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17 for I will restore health unto thee and heal thee of thy wounds saith the Lord because they they called thee an outcast saying this is Zion whom no man seeketh after And to put it in the Message Bible, he says, Everyone who hurt you will be hurt. This is verses 16 and 17 together. Everyone who hurt you will be hurt. Your enemies will end up as slaves. Your plunderers will be plundered. Your looters will become loot. Verse 17, As for you, I'll come with healing, curing the incurable, Because they all gave up on you and dismissed you as hopeless. Meaning that God will put back, he will prepare and clear away all of the obstacles, the hindrances, the sabotage, the the dirty tricks, the voodoo, the hex, the vex. Anything that any enemy had deliberately sown into your life or a family member or some sin or some indiscretion or iniquity that had been in the family that you that you had no knowledge of he is going to unearth all of that remove it clear it away and give you a brand new start i'll come with healing curing the incurable meaning that folks were sitting back waiting for you to die not going to happen folks that were enjoying you being broke He's going to restore your finances back. Those who enjoyed you being on a sick bed, they're going to see you running, jumping, leaping, dancing, and praising God in their face. Why? Because they all gave up on you and dismissed you as hopeless. So he's going to rewrite the story for you. And the last scripture will be Joel chapter 2, verse 25. I'll give it to you in the King James first. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent against you. What are can- canker worms and palmer worms? They're things that eat up all the leaves and strip 
a tree bare or they eat up the bark of the tree, meaning that he'll deal with those that try and kill the seed before it even gets a chance to grow. But for those things that had grown and had flourished in your life that had been stripped bare, he will restore all of that back to you. It means all those folks that were eating and chewing off of your labor, off of your ideas, off of your talent, off of your skill, off of your time, off of the love in your heart, all those things that are investments. It takes time in order to cultivate land. It takes time in order to grow seeds. It takes time for things in order to sprout and grow and get a strong root system to go deeper into the ground so they can sprout higher and grow upward. You have to go downward first before you can go upward. So for these things that had already taken root downward and sprung up upward and they had been stripped bare, they had been eaten bare, they had been wiped away bare to the point there was nothing left, all of that will be restored back. Every single bit of it. If there's nothing there in order to point to for all your labor that you put in because somebody went and cut it down before it even had a chance to flourish, he will replace it. And he'll make sure that no enemy will come in and so in any more hindrances, obstacles, sabotage, booby traps, whatever else you want to call it. He will make sure that whatever is sown into the ground, good seeds that you put into the ground, they will grow, they will flourish, they will strengthen, and they will last. So if we can just stick it out and stay in the master's hand, hold on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, you know what? There will be no more instances, I believe. He is on post and he's watching and he's going to see to it that the enemies that keep trying to creep in Gone are the days where they're going to kill things off that he wants planted before they even get a chance. This is April Vassell. This is Breaking the Truth in Love. God bless you. Let's let the master farmer and cultivator of our souls do the job that he needs to do so we can grow into the people that he needs us to be. God bless you.